Hi, Daisy and Eli. Welcome to week, what is it, week Hi. six of our current events class? I think so. Okay, well, I know this week I gave you a lot of background material, but I thought that since it was all stuff you could listen to without reading, maybe it wouldn't be so hard to get through all of it. Did you get through all of it? Yeah. All right, well done. Um, and this is a good chance for me to remind people watching at home that if they haven't already, they can go back and watch the introductory video to this week's lesson. And all the background materials we're gonna be talking about are in the details below that video. And then when you come back and watch this, you should feel free to pause the conversation and have your own discussion at home and then restart the video as you want to. So with all of that said, shall we dive in? Yeah. yeah. I'm curious if a couple of weeks ago I had asked you to just imagine the U.S.-Mexico border and describe what it looked like in your mind. Like, what would you have described? Maybe a fence with gates and border patrol. And, mm -hmm. yeah. I usually imagine a word which is craziness because a lot of people are trying to get it get in a lot of people are trying to stop people from getting out uh and in the article and on likely friendship it really shows that there's two well there's multiple really strong sides that are against each other and just really crazy you know one of the th i mean everything that you're saying is true and and is right but one of the things that surprised me in the time that i spent there is that when we hear about the US-Mexico border, usually what we hear about is the debate over people without documentation trying to cross the border. But there is so much traffic back and forth across the border of people and goods and trucks, and, and that's all legal back and forth. It happens every day. And the immigration debate is just a small part of what happens at the border, but it's a big part of the debate that we hear from where we live. Definitely. You know? um, so in the stories that you listened to, what surprised you? What did you think um, was unexpected in those, in those articles? How many people arrive every day? I knew there was like a lot of people, but I expected it to be like just one family arriving every like half hour or maybe, or like maybe even an hour, not like 50 people arriving like in, Groups of like 50 or more rising yeah. every day, multiple times. Day after day after day. That's right. And, and Eli, when you pictured people arriving, what kinds of people did you usually picture? People who were either in financial trouble or just regular people who wanted to move to the U.S. Did you picture adults, men, women, kids, families? Um, I picture both because there was a lot of people coming across the border and there was people of every, there was men, women, adults, children, babies. One of the things that surprised me when I was there was how many kids were crossing the border with their yeah. parents, but so many kids. Daisy, what surprised you about the background materials that I had you listen to? It, but actually, I was, interested in the subject beforehand i thought yeah. like i wanted to i knew it was chaotic but i wanted to figure out all the chaos or the craziness so yeah. it didn't really surprise me but getting to know more that i didn't know was interesting which characters in the stories seemed the most interesting to you who were the people that you wanted to know more about um I'd say every part is interesting and I like hearing everyone's side to this story. So I don't really know. What about you, Eli? Was there somebody who you thought, oh, I'd be interested to spend more time with that person? Not really. I just thought it was crazy, like the sheer numbers of the amount of people who crossed there every day, like, and how little people they had to control it. Yeah. So there was a word that came up a lot in these stories, and I don't know if it's a word that you're familiar with, and the word is asylum. Do you know what asylum is? Um, it's a place, uh, an asylum was, where they put people who they thought were mad or crazy. 
but usually they that, just had a disability or something and it wasn't treated well. But you know what, I was also seeking safety. That's exactly right. So the kind of place that insane people were kept was, it used to be called an asylum, and we don't really use that word anymore, but those two meanings of the word have a connection because as you say, asylum is sort of like seeking safety. And it used to be that they thought this was a place you could keep people um, with mental illness safe. But now, if somebody crosses a border seeking asylum, Daisy, what do you think that means? That means they're looking for a new life, basically. There are, that, that's true, that's true. But there are a lot of different reasons somebody could cross a border looking for a new life. Yeah. You know, maybe jobs pay better in the country that you're going to. And those people are seeking a new life, but they're not asylum seekers. And asylum actually has a very specific legal meaning. And you have a right to apply for asylum if you meet certain requirements. If you're persecuted, if you're in danger for your life, if you're fleeing people who are after you because of your religion or your race or your political affiliation, then you can show up in a different country and say, I'm claiming asylum. And one of the important things about the laws surrounding the border is that the United States treats people differently depending on whether they are claiming asylum or saying, I think I can get a better paying job in the United States and so I'm gonna go there. One of the things that surprised me about the people I met was that so many of the people crossing the border from Mexico into the US were not Mexicans. They were not coming from Mexico. Did you catch that detail? Yeah. Do you remember where they were coming from? No, do you, Daisy? Wasn't it like in where they had a bunch of gangs, like I forget the place, Afghanistan? Yes. At it? No, because no, uh, so, a lot no. of um, single mothers were being threatened because uh, their fathers, often in another country, were yeah. getting. So you're and exactly they were out because they thought they were getting money and they were searched for money. Yeah. So the countries that have the most people coming to the U.S. seeking asylum right now are in Central America. Do you know where Central America is? Yeah, it's down. between South America and North America. Exactly. Central America. Exactly. It's <laughs> south of Mexico. So can you name any of the countries in Central America? Uh, putting you on the spot here. Do um, either of you know any Central American uh, countries? No, that's not. No. Um, I'm thinking that's that more than Africa. I think. One of them begins with L, E L, we not know. the letter L. Oh, no. El Salvador? Salvador? Yes, exactly, El Salvador. <laughs> and another one begins with the letter G. Guatemala. Yes, good job. <laughs> one more, it begins with an H. Honolulu. Honduras. 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 Honduras, that's right. That's right. So um, you were saying <laughs> this, Daisy, but why are all of these people from El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras trying to come to the United States? Usually because they're threatened or looking for a better job. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of gangs in those countries that are persecuting people and threatening them. And so they're trying to come to the United States for safety. But here's a tricky question. If Central America is here and then Mexico is here and the United States is up here, why are those people from Central America coming to the United States instead of Mexico? I mean, they have to pass through Mexico, but why do you think they're trying to come to the United States? I think Mex uh, you, the U.S. also has better jobs or higher minimum wage. Yeah, in Mexico, there's a lot more poverty and a lot fewer jobs and the jobs there are don't necessarily pay as well. And so the United States is a place where, especially if you have kids and you're hoping that your kids will have a better life than you, are, than you have had, it's a place where you can try to find a better life for your kids. 
And so people are seeking safety and they're seeking refuge and they're seeking asylum. But one reason they're doing that in the United States is because this is a country where you can have some expectation that your kids will grow up to have a better life than you had. And it's just like the California gold rush when they hear like anything precious like gold or good jobs or a better life. A lot of people believe it because one person came back with a handful of gold and they believed it was true. But by the time they got there, there was no gold left. And so. they would, it's super rare to find, to, find, no. to get into the UF and be perfectly fine off. Like, you're lucky if you get like a job at McDonald's immediately. You know, I understand the point that you're making, and it's an interesting analogy, but I think that if you are a farmer from El Salvador, and you come to the United States, and you work on a farm in the United States, picking vegetables or fruit, your child probably will grow up to have a better life than if you had stayed on the farm in El Salvador. And so... In that sense, it's not like the California gold rush because I think the expectation that people in the United States can grow up and have a better life than they can in some of these Central American countries, not in every case, but in many cases, I think is an accurate, true expectation that people can have a better life and raise their children to have more opportunities than they would have if they had stayed in those countries. You, what did you think of the story that was in Mexico when we went to that shelter for migrants? Do you remember that story? Yes. Yeah. It was about... There was like... The, wasn't there two about shelters? There was... Yeah. There was, there was a detail from the story about the shelter in Mexico that really stood out to me, that surprised me a lot. And it was when the man talked about how much you had to pay the human oh, smuggler. That, that, I thought you were you talking about that? The, the shelter that the private company decided to run. But oh, well, that was the detention place. center. But I'm talking about in Mexico where the people trying to get to the United States or the people who had been recently deported were gathering. And the man who ran the shelter said, I don't know if you remember this figure, you used to have to pay a human smuggler $1,000 to get to Houston, Texas. And now do you remember what the number is? 10,000. Exactly. Why do you think the cost went up 10 times? Because so many people needed to move. They needed to get going. Well, that's part of it. But another big part of it is- if They were that building the, a wall. That's right, Daisy. The border security got so much more intense that they had to, go to longer lengths to get people across the border and they could charge a lot more money. Who was charging money to bring people across the border? Did you understand who those groups were? Yeah. Are they good upstanding travel agents and tour guides? No. Uh, no, I read a book about them and they weren't the nicest people. No, they they're... Are these people. Um, they didn't give a lot of like food or water um just enough to survive and sometimes and not even that much because and the people like in the car could barely afford the trip and sometimes would have to wagger it but sure. wait your thank you um and so yeah they were treated very poorly just they would just like throw them in the back of a van and drive that's exactly right so here's my question for you when it costs someone's entire life savings and they have to go deep into debt to do it and they don't get enough food or water or air on the way and they know they might not even survive the journey why would they do it in spite of all those things well it depends if they're really in deep like a gang thinks they have an inheritance and they're gonna kill and they're threatening to kill their family if they don't give up a certain amount of money like a time I would even do it but because nobody wants to just die. There's a better chance that you'll survive going on a trip than just defying one a powerful game. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's desperation, I think is the word that you're describing. Gangs are very powerful, and to be threatened by a gang is really, like, changing. Even if they're like, you should join our gang, then that's also changing because they might convince you to do things you don't want to do. And once you're in it, like they know you and they've got to know you well, so it's even harder to get out of. Yeah, and in some of these places, the police are controlled by the gangs and the mayors are controlled by the gangs. What, we use the word cartels, but the cartels are basically, it's another word for gangs. And these same people who are smuggling humans across the border might also be smuggling drugs and weapons. And for them, it's a chance to make money off of human desperation. So there are also things that cross the border every day, as we discussed, all the time, legally, what kinds of things cross the border? Well, documented immigrants. People, there are people who live in the United States and work in Mexico, and there are people who live in Mexico and work in the United States. There are even people who go to school on the opposite side of the border. Their parents might live on one side of the border and their school's on the other side of the border and they go back and forth every single day. And what about in all those trucks? There was like an hour long lineup of cars when I was going from Mexico into the United States. What's in all those trucks? Sometimes people being smuggled, but also goods. Yeah, what kinds of goods, for example? I might just went like to what they made in Mexico. Um, I should know this. There's probably things in your refrigerator right now that were grown on farms in Mexico. Sugar cane? There's fruits and vegetables. There's yeah. clothing. There's electronics. There's so much that goes back. Parts for cars. Probably the car your parents drive has parts that were made in Mexico that came across the border. Yeah. Maybe. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't want you to think of the border as a place that is just human smugglers and drug trafficking and people trying to chase and catch each close other. The border, almost. What'd you say? If it was just smugglers and, and uh, people carrying drugs and smuggling stuff in, it would be simple enough. I'm pretty sure everybody would agree, most people, that if it was just drugs being smuggled across, the borders would have been closed a long time ago. Yeah, but if you close a border, then you don't get all of the important things that the U.S. gets from Mexico and the Mexico gets from the U.S. Food and clothes and electronics and car parts and all of the other stuff. Yeah. So tell me what you thought about the story of Raymondville, Texas, the town where there were not a lot of good jobs and this immigration detention center, kind of like a prison, set up shop in the town. What do you think of that? That was the private company setting up that one, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure the private company just wanted to make some money. Like, they saw an opportunity. They're like, oh, okay. I agree. Yeah. Oh, gladly set up a detention center for everybody. And no, uh, and yeah, you can pay us. You, we'll, we'll, we'll take the payment. So, Daisy, I'm going to ask you a tough question. You ready? Uh, if you were the mayor of the town and that company said, we want to set then? up Raymondville, Texas. Okay. And this company came and said, we want to set up an immigration detention center and it is going to have a lot of good paying jobs and the people of your town who might only make 10, 15 bucks an hour are going to make a lot more money than that. And they will be hiring all of these people. As the mayor, what would you do? I'd say, can you think of any other job that would punish people? <clears throat> Eli, what would you do? Well, it depends on how bad Raymondville, Texas was going and how, like, if people could, if people can still get by with a bit of stuff to spare, then I probably would say no. But if my town was struggling, I have, mayors have a duty to their citizens 
So if the town is really struggling, they almost have to say yes. They don't have to, but they probably should because it's the town, the town of their, the citizens of their job. Daisy, what do you think of that? Yeah, I agree with Eli. Well, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough question. I mean, yeah. it is a tough question, right? So, um, I also want to ask you about the story about the two friends who were so different, but still respect each other. Did that one surprise you? Yeah, that, that surprised me, but I... I can see how they can just put their differences aside and be friends. They may argue, but they can still be friends. Daisy, do you have any friends who you disagree with, but you're still friends? Um, well, yeah. I mean, we probably disagreed on one thing or another one time. Like, oh, I like pink. Oh, I don't like pink. Little stuff like that. Yeah. I got a friend. Stuff? who I disagreed with all the time, and we were really great friends all that's, the time about everything. I think that's important. I think it's important to be able to be friends with people you disagree with and Absolutely. be able to learn from them. So did you have questions about the, the materials for this week? Yes, yes we did. We did. OK, fire and away. some other people did, too. But, oh, so great. I had one. Do you want to start with yours or the ones oh. from Twitter? Oh, you want to start with ours? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, how long, on average, does it take to reunite parents uh, and children after they like go to detention centers or are shipped away? Is it years sure. or months or just days or week or hours? That's a really good question, and there's not a simple answer because. Until now, there weren't as many family separations. I say until now. Until a couple of years ago when I was reporting that story, there weren't family separations. But the Trump administration decided one way to discourage people from trying to cross the border was to let parents know that they would be separated from their children if they did cross the border. So they thought that would make people stop trying. But then all of these families got separated, and the government didn't know where people were. And so sometimes the parents were sent back to Central America and the children were still in the United States. And sometimes they were just in different detention centers in the same state, but sometimes they were in different detention centers in different states. And so, as you heard in that very first story, a judge set a deadline for the government to reunite all the parents and kids. But by the time the deadline arrived, what happened? They weren't all reunited. They weren't all reunited. Many of them were, and then soon most of them were, but because they had such bad record keeping, there were some that it took a really long time to reunite. So the whole thing was really chaotic, and it was kind of a disorganized mess, but to call it a disorganized mess makes it sound abstract, when really it was like parents and children being kept apart from each other even after a judge said they had to be brought back together. So you can see why from the perspective of the news, it was an important story that we needed to tell people about. Yeah. Definitely. Daisy, what questions did you have? Or what do uh, you think about that? I mean, before we move on to your questions, what, what do you think about that? I don't know. Oh, I agree. It's very chaotic. Um, and well, I don't know what else to say about that. Oops. Eli, do you have any thoughts about that? No, not really. OK, <laughs> why don't we move on to another question, Daisy? What did you want to ask uh, about? I had one about the butterfly preserve. Oh, I, yeah, the butterfly preserve. Did you see the photographs of that place? Yeah, it was beautiful. Definitely. Yeah, my friend Claire Harbage took those photographs. She and I worked together. Nice. What was how, your question? How many people's houses are being knocked, knocked down? That's an interesting question, and I actually don't know the answer. And some Do you have people, an estimate? Well, I know that some people whose houses are scheduled to be knocked down are going to court to challenge it. And there are other organizations like the Butterfly Preserve 
that are saying, we're gonna go to court to try to prevent you from building the wall here. And when the government knocks down a house to build something, it's, it, the phrase for that is called eminent domain. It's just kind of a legal term, but then the government is supposed to pay the person for the thing they knock down. So like they pay the homeowner for the house. But it's a really good question and I actually don't know the total number. And part of the reason I don't know the total number is to be honest, just that I haven't looked it up. But another part of the reason that we don't know the total number is that we still don't know exactly how many miles of wall will finally be built. And that's gonna make a difference between whether there's a much higher number or a lower number of houses and other buildings that get knocked down. Do you have an estimate for how many houses have already been knocked down? You know, I could probably look that number up, but I don't have it right off the top okay. of my head. I'm sorry. Um, but if you wanted to do even a little more homework when we're done with this lesson, you could look it up. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I had a question about the butterfly preserve story, which yeah. is butterflies can fly, so why couldn't they just fly over the wall? That was a point they put in the story. I think they said that it would also destroy the land and there were some plants that were endangered that would yeah. be demolished and they already started doing them and it like affected the butterflies, I think. Yeah, that's true. That's all right. Oh. And that's all accurate. And the other thing is that some butterflies just don't fly way, way, way up in the air. They fly close to the ground, and that is what that species does. And if they fly close to the ground, and there's a wall that's 20 feet high, they're just not gonna fly 25 feet to get over the wall. Yeah. Do you wanna ask some of the questions that people submitted on Twitter? Sure. Sure. Um, I'll ask the first one, and it's from 13-year-old Logan. And they asked, why won't the US people why won't the U.S. let people immigrate, and why did the private company decide to run a detention center? So those are two different questions, but they're both good questions. The first one was, why doesn't the U.S. let people immigrate? And the answer is, the U.S. does let some people immigrate, but the U.S. decides whether it's going to let these people, but not those people, whether it'll let people immigrate this way, but not that way. And some people would like to see more immigration, and some people would like to see less immigration. And right now, there is a, an administration that wants to see less immigration. And why do you think that is? Why do you think they want to see less immigration? They like how the economy is they like how um, uh well there's job shortage and more people means less job for uh for the people already in america so they'll probably think about that and right now there's a huge job shortage so i doubt they're letting anybody immigrate because of covid19 obviously but also because they probably wouldn't anyway because there's so many jobs that nobody can do and they need jobs so if the, uh, the immigrants get jobs there won't be jobs left for the Ameri American people who already live there unless if they lost their job and it'll be a complete that's, mess. That's a good explanation for the reason that they give. There are also arguments on the other side. For example, one in four doctors is an immigrant. Did you know that? No. <laughs> A lot of nurses are immigrants from other countries. And so as we look at the strained healthcare system and the need for healthcare workers, one solution could be bringing in more healthcare workers from other countries, which actually leads to a point that I wanted to make sure is clear. We're talking a lot about people immigrating by crossing the United States border from Mexico. But most people who are in the country without documentation did not cross over the border from Mexico. Do you know how most people in the country without documentation wound up here? By boat? Yes. By, no, not by they plane. Came in, they came in on a tourist visa or a student visa, and they came into the country legally, and then they just stayed longer than they were supposed to. And so when you hear the debate about undocumented immigrants and the debate about the border, it's worth remembering that most people who are in the country who are undocumented 
didn't come across the border. They came in as students or tourists or something else, and they just stuck around. And so the other question that Logan asked was, why does the company want to run this detention center? And I think you kind of had an answer to that. What do you think the answer is? Money. I mean, the company, just because of that detention, detention center, because nobody, uh, they're not going to be uh, making immigrants go anywhere. Right now, they can't have anybody move to the detention center. They'll get money and they'll probably be a company that survives this. What other questions were there from Twitter? Um, there Did was one uh, from nine-year-old Flynn and they asked, why don't they want people to come into the U.S. After for a better life, and why don't we encourage immigration to help the economy? So, you know, let's actually take the second question first. Why don't we encourage immigration to help the economy? Because, Eli, you were saying, well, immigrants might take jobs that Americans could have, and then Americans won't have work. And that's one argument that some economists make, but there are other economists who say, actually, immigration helps the economy because you have a lot of people doing the kind of work that's really, really hard to do and it doesn't pay a lot of money, like picking vegetables and fruits and washing dishes in restaurant kitchens. And when you have people doing that work and paying taxes and you know, supporting their community by buying groceries and all of the other things that people do when they live in a community, that actually helps the economy. And so you have a lot yeah. of debate among economists over this. Yeah, and also, who knows, maybe the, uh, one of them could have a great idea and start their own business and create hundreds of more jobs. Exactly. So many immigrants to the United States founded some of the biggest companies in the world, and those companies have created a huge number of jobs and wealth and opportunities. And what was the other question? Uh, the other question was, why don't they want people to come into the U.S. for a better life? So that's talking less about job seekers and more about asylum seekers. I mean, what if somebody is persecuted in El Salvador and they come to the United States saying, oh, actually, I guess it could be about more than just asylum seekers, now that I'm thinking it through. Um, well, what do you think? I mean, I th maybe we kind of answered that question, too, already. Yeah, because I believe we said this before, too many people coming in to seek a better life could make the better life a worse life by taking up jobs and work could help, but people are always thinking about it. Don't take up jobs. There will be no room left. There will be too many people in America. There won't be room for anybody else. We'll become overpopulated and a hundred other problems that probably won't happen. You know, there's something else we're thinking about too, which is that I think often people are afraid of people who seem different. Whether it's people who are a different race or speak a different language or come from a different country, there's kind of a human instinct to say, there's us and there's them. And we look out for us and we keep them away. However you define us and them. And I wonder whether that has something to do with this too. What do you think? I think it probably does. Discrimination. I mean, it's still alive today. Hmm. Daisy, what do you think? Yeah, it sounds like discrimination does. There was something that I discovered when I was a foreign correspondent. Have you ever heard the phrase nation of immigrants? Uh, kind of, well, we are a nation of immigrants, if I know what it means. It's that everybody here immigrated here. Yeah, with the exception of Native Americans yeah. and indigenous peoples. Well, they eventually, Everybody. they eventually would have immigrated here because uh, human life started, like the first human, actually human civilization. Not like okay. and stuff, but like- Well, let's actually, say with the exception of indigenous peoples, everyone in the United States immigrated within the last several centuries. Yeah, definitely. And one of the things that I didn't appreciate until I'm correspondent, and I spent time in 
countries where people could trace their history in that country back almost forever. You know, they could say 15 generations of my family lived in Ireland or 15 generations of my family lived in Turkey or whatever the country was. And I realized that in the United States, we can't, most of us say that because almost all of us can remember a time, so, not remember, but trace our families back to a time when our ancestors came over as immigrants, whether that was from Europe or Latin America or Asia or Africa or someplace else. Yeah. So do you have any other questions before we wrap up? Um, I had one more, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so it kind of has an answer, but I wonder if I'm missing something. Why are the gangs being punished? like by the non-corrupt policemen and who would punish them? Why are the immigrants being punished, you mean, for crossing for the, the gangs, border? The gangs. For, uh, the gang for uh, threatening people. And you mean uh, uh, in Mexico, why aren't like the police going after the gang? Well, Is that yeah, why, why they're being corrupted. And like, not, if not the police, who would? Is there anybody else who looks out for the people? It's a constant struggle. And there are good law enforcement officers that are trying to fight the gangs, but the gangs have a lot of power and influence, and it's a really tough struggle. Well, and another thing that's worth thinking about, even though this isn't necessarily the focus of immigration of our immigration conversation, is a lot of the gangs get a lot of money by selling drugs in the United States. And so people in the United States who are doing certain drugs that come up from Central America, when they spend their money on those drugs, what they're really doing is supporting, supporting the business of those Central American gangs. Like, like, you know, have you heard of cocaine? Cocaine yeah. is a drug that almost all of it comes to the US from south of the border. And so when people in the United States buy cocaine, their money is going to fund those gangs that are doing all of those terrible things that is making people come up north. Yeah, so really if we want to stop, uh, if you want to stop immigration, you should also stop drug trafficking. If you think immigration, if you think immigration is bad, stop the things that support. All of these systems are interconnected. Yeah. Daisy, did you have any other questions? Um, I did, but I think my question was answered through the. Okay. So, what do you think about all this stuff? I mean, what's your takeaway here? Well, it's a very interesting subject with a lot of hot opinions, but I thought it was fun to learn about so we can know more about it we need to. Daisy, and do you feel like you, you see this differently now that you've heard these stories from the border? Yeah. What do I you see differently about it? I mean, like, what's changed in your, in your I opinion? I usually got quick stories because I, like, glance at the moon the news so this time i got like more in detail i guess okay well thanks for another great discussion i'm really impressed with your questions and your conversation it's been great to see you all right bye bye, okay, bye.